Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at Island Baptist Church online on this beautiful day. As has been our tradition for years, we open our service with a psalm as we find it a good practice to draw near to the throne of God as he instructs us. Let's draw near to him now as I read Psalm 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him. He helps me. Therefore, my heart leaps for joy, and with my song I will praise him. Sometimes the door to joy is through suffering. Some of us are suffering today. Uh, Jesus led this perfect life. Um, he went to the cross so that we could have this uh, different perspective on things. We walk through and get refined through suffering. All other things get stripped away, and what's left is what is most essential. Are you seeing what's essential today? I hope so. Let's bow our head in prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift to you President Trump and Governor Murphy, as well as Deputy, uh, our mayors Davis and Mancini. Give them wisdom as they would make sound decisions as they lead our country, state, and communities. We also pray for Pastors Luke Frazier and Dan Stott and others as they would be strong leaders of our local churches during these difficult times. Help them rebalance their, their, their time each day as they meet the needs of our community in new ways. Help them be safe as well. As you promise to meet our needs, Lord, uh, the Apostle Luke writes, Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one sparrow is forgotten by God. Do not be afraid, for you are worth much more than many sparrows. Thank you for that true and essential thing in our lives, that you give us that joy this day as we serve you. Amen. Now Dave Jones will lead us in song as we prepare our hearts and minds for what God has in store for us through Pastor Luke today. Thank you. Strength, the 
my King. You are the words that I sing. You are the reason I make this offering. You are my God and my King. You are the words that I sing. You are the reason I make this offering. You are my God and my King. You are the words that I sing. You are the reason I make this offering. You are my God and my King. You are the words that I sing. You are the reason I make this offering. You are the Lord. You are the way, the truth, the morning. The title for this morning's message will probably strike you as a bit peculiar. I've entitled this Palm Sunday sermon, The Boundary That Science Cannot Breach. Now, this may seem a bit odd to you for a Palm Sunday message, and it's true. This is an odd subject for a day like today. But I'm convinced that by the time we're completed with this service, you'll understand why the Lord led me to preach on this subject. Before we do anything, we need to ask God for his help. So I'm asking you that you would pray with me. I'm convinced that this particular message at this particular time has the power to transform lives, to change hearts, And to change minds. But I can't do this alone. I need God. Without God speaking to you through me. I have nothing to offer anyone. You may as well turn this off right now. We need to hear from God. You don't want to hear from me. So let's pray together. Father I'm open. I'm open. I'm willing I want to be yielded entirely to the Holy Spirit to offer to your people whatever it is that you might have to say to them. I'm willing even to throw this entire message in the trash can and preach something totally different if it be your will. I just want to be used by you to speak to your people. And so I pray, dear God, that you would do that now by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would speak and your people would have ears to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me offer you the most basic definition that I possibly can for science. Science is knowledge or to know. And the stated goal of science is to understand the universe and everything in it. The Western world has six main fields or schools or branches, you may say, of natural science. Now, there are many more than just these six, but these are the six main branches. Mathematics, astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology, and geology. All six of these main 
fields or branches or schools of natural science aim to answer three primary questions. Now, please, these are not exhaustive. There are many more questions that science aims to answer. But there are three primary questions that all fields of science aim to get to the bottom of. Here are those, those three main questions. Number one, who are we? Number two, where did we come from? And finally, where are we going? These three essential questions have never been answered by the scientific community for one very important reason. It's because the Western scientific community refuses to acknowledge the plain evidence of a divine creator whose jurisdiction over his creation has no boundary lines. And when you remove the creator from the equation, everything you discover will only be half truths. Jonathan Edwards, whose scientific writings were published by Harvard University when he was nine years old, had this to say. Nature is God's greatest evangelist. What Edwards knew is that anything that can be studied under a microscope or seen through the lens of the world's most powerful telescope falls under the jurisdiction of the one who created it. But what even most Christians fail to recognize, or at least fail to incorporate into their daily practical life, is that the Bible assigns all that jurisdiction to a man named Jesus. There's nothing in all of creation, not a small rock or a great mountain, not a great ocean or the smallest drop of water, not a microorganism or a virus that does not fall under the jurisdiction of the man, Jesus, the God-man. In fact, there is no boundary lines to his jurisdiction. He has full and complete sovereign authority over everything that is. That's the main point of this message that I hope to drive home to you this morning. Take a look up on your screen. The big idea, as we call it, or the main point is that the jurisdiction of Jesus has no boundary lines. So bring me your astronomers with their high-powered telescopes. Bring me your biologists with their high-powered microscopes. And there is nothing that they will discover that does not fall under the jurisdiction of Jesus, the God-man. At this point, there's likely someone at home, maybe this is you, thinking to yourself, or maybe you're even saying out loud, Hold, hold on just a minute there, Pastor. You're assigning things to Jesus and ascribing things to him that he never actually said. Show me where he said that all authority or all jurisdiction, all dominion belongs to him. Let me just address you for just a moment. In the plainest possible language that a person could use, not in parable form like Jesus loved to teach in, but in plain language, Jesus claimed to have all dominion, all authority, full and complete jurisdiction over the entirety of heaven and the earth. Take a look. See for yourself. I'm going to put it up on your screen. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority, and he means all has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And you want to know what's interesting? What's interesting is the word that Jesus used for heaven here. It's actually plural, the heavens and on the earth. What Jesus is saying is that his dominion, his authority, his jurisdiction, isn't limited just to earth's atmosphere, which the Bible calls the first heaven. It goes beyond that into the second heaven, which we would call the interstellar or outer space, yes, 
His jurisdiction is there too. But it even goes beyond that to what the Bible calls the third heaven, which is the very dwelling place of God, the spiritual um, domain of God outside of the universe. Do you see what Jesus is saying? His jurisdiction has no boundary lines. There is nothing in all the universe, nothing in your life that he does not have divine authority and jurisdiction and control over. Someone else might be sitting at home and thinking, Pastor Luke, I know all this stuff. I went to Sunday school my whole life. How does this knowledge of the sovereign divine authority of Jesus help me practically? How is this supposed to get me through what many are calling the most confusing time in America's history? Those are legitimate questions that I hope to give you an answer to as we make our way through this service. Today's Palm Sunday. Today is the day when Christians all over the world remember the the day in history when Jesus rode into Jerusalem mounted on the back of a young donkey. When he rode through, there were multitudes of people there who wanted to acknowledge his divine authority over all the earth and over all their lives. They wanted to, listen close, crown him king of kings and lord of lords and see him take his throne right there in Jerusalem, right then and there. But today is unlike any Palm Sunday, at least that I can remember in my short lifetime. Today is unique for one very important reason. There are two crowns competing for your attention and your awe today. As most of you probably know, the coronavirus has been named corona, which means crown. And it bears that name because of its resemblance to a diadem or a crown. If you look at some of the pictures on the internet, you'll probably see at least some resemblance or you'll understand at least partially why they named it that. What I hope to show you today is a crown far more worthy of your attention. Everyone in the world is caught up by this virus that has overtaken our whole planet. Today, I hope to help you look through a lens more powerful than any telescope that man will ever make. More powerful even than the most powerful microscope that we have. I hope to help you look through a lens that gives you a glimpse into the mind of God. And to help you see the crown that is truly worthy of your attention. Here's what I want to do. If you have a Bible... I encourage you to grab it now. We're going to be comparing two different passages today because I want to help you see a glimpse of Jesus that maybe some of you have never seen before. We're going to look at the Palm Sunday passage where Jesus rode into Jerusalem, but we're going to interpret that passage through another passage. What I want you to do is turn to Luke chapter 19. That's where the Palm Sunday passage is found. But I also want you to keep your finger there, and then I also want you to flip over to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be comparing these two passages. We're going to be interpreting the one passage in Luke 19 with the other passage in Colossians chapter 1. Luke 19 was written by a scientist. A man in Greece named Luke who was a physician who used the scientific method or at least a form of it For his daily livelihood. We're going to see through the lens of a physician. The day, the true historical day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. But then we're going to interpret that passage by one of Luke's friends, the Apostle Paul. A philosopher and a theologian. 
an incredibly brilliant mind, the likes of which most of mankind has never seen before. Are you ready to do this with me? Turn now to Luke 19, or you can look up on your screen. It's there. Here's what the scientist physician Luke had to say. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this. The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Here's a humble man, a king, riding on the back of a young donkey. But this was no mere man. I want to show you now what Paul, a friend of Dr. Luke's, had to say about this same man who was riding into Jerusalem humble on the back of a donkey. Flip now over to Colossians chapter 1 and look at the identity of this humble man. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. Stop for just a moment. This is not referring to um, his birth. This is referring to his preeminent rank and position over all of creation. Okay? Now keep reading. For by him. By who? By Jesus. All things were created. In heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, which includes all microscopic organisms and viruses, mind you. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. That means he's eternal. And in him, all things are. Hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Time out. In other words, sorry Buddhists, sorry New Age spiritualists, all the deity in the universe dwells in one package, one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, not in all of creation. Keep reading through to the end. And through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, do you see the jurisdiction here? Making peace by the blood of the cross, meaning that the sacrifice of Jesus made on the cross is the means by which God is making all things right again. For the remainder of our time together, here's what I want to do. I want to take 
you through this true historical account of Palm Sunday, the passage we just read in Luke 19. And I want to show you three categories of the jurisdiction of Jesus. I'm only going to devote a few minutes to each of these three categories. So please, wherever you are, give me your undivided attention. Give God your undivided attention. Give the word your undivided attention. Put yourself in a distraction-free environment. We're only going to give a few minutes to each of these three categories of the jurisdiction of Jesus, beginning with category number one. Jesus has jurisdiction over all living creatures. Look back with me at verses 29 through 31. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So let's ask an obvious question. Who does this man think he is? And please, I don't mean that to sound brash, and I certainly don't mean that to sound irreverent. I mean... Look at the text. Here's Jesus sending his disciples to go and assume possession of an animal that belongs to another man. And as he sends them, Jesus seems to assume that there might be at least the potential for some conflict. That's why he tells them, if anyone asks you what it is that you're doing, simply reply, The Lord has need of it. So I ask again, who does this man believe himself to be that he would tell his disciples, go and take possession of that animal because the Lord has need of it? Isn't it obvious? He can talk this way because he himself is the animal's maker. It was made by him and for him. Look back at Colossians 1 and you'll see this very plainly. Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth. All things were created through him. And for him, Christian, listen, Jesus has jurisdiction over all living creatures because not just this young cult, but all animal life, all species on planet earth were made for him to reflect his beauty and his glory and his majesty. Here's what this means practically. That whenever a biologist looks under the microscope to see anything small, any living organism, or whenever um, a scientist goes out to study the habits of any kind of animal life, they are looking at something which hopefully, if they inspect close enough, they will begin to see the evidence of the divine mind that created that animal To show how great and wonderful and beautiful he is. Do you see? Every single thing that has been created was created by him, for him, and through him. So that people would look at the animal and see the glory of its maker. Now again, to the one who's sitting at home and asking that very relevant question Look, Pastor, I learned these things when I was in Sunday school. We sang songs about these things. But what practical application could this possibly have for me and my family in this time of great confusion? Here it is. The plain reality of the principle that I'm trying to bring before you this morning in this first point, that Jesus has jurisdiction over all living creatures is simply this. The same doctor who wrote what you're reading, Dr. Luke, the same scientific mind, also recorded one of the most tender-hearted words of Jesus to his disciples who were afraid 
of what might happen to them if they continued to follow him. Listen to how Jesus talked to his disciples when he realized that fear was beginning to build up in their hearts. Take a look. It's just a few chapters prior in Luke chapter 12. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. The jurisdiction of Jesus over all living creatures is supposed to take a person like you and like me who's prone to fear and anxiety and panic It's supposed to take our worried hearts and minds and move it along on a logical train of thought. God gave you the ability to think logically. And you're supposed to think, if God, my God, my Jesus, the one who would sacrifice himself for me, loves even the small sparrows and all of the insects and butterflies and things that creep and crawl on the ground, if he cares for them, How much more valuable am I to him? I, who am made in his image. He has jurisdiction over me, too. And that's the second point that I want to draw your attention to. Point number two. Jesus has jurisdiction over all mankind. Look back at verses 32 through 38 of Luke 19. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, here it comes, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Notice there was no argument at all recorded in this passage from the person. They acknowledged the jurisdiction of Jesus over them. Seems like as soon as they said, the Lord has need of it, at least in in this passage, They handed the colt right over. Keep reading. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Do you see what's happening here? Oh, I hope you can picture this in your mind. They're not only acknowledging his jurisdiction over animals. They're acknowledging his jurisdiction over them. They're bowing and worshiping the God man who's standing right before them. Keep reading. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What a scene. Now before we do anything else, I need to correct a common error that's often depicted in artist renditions of this scene that we're reading about. The common error is found in verse 37 where the word multitudes is used. Dr. Luke used the the word multitudes to describe a large number of people. But in order to understand really what was happening... You have to go back and read a little bit of history. The historian Josephus describes that there were roughly between 80,000 and 100,000 people living within the city limits of Jerusalem during the time when Jesus rode in on the donkey. But during the Passover, which is what's happening here, Jews and Gentiles alike would pour into the city limits. And he estimates that there were roughly around 3 million people who would pour into Jerusalem during the Passover. So according to the historian, he estimates 2.7 million people would likely have been in the city limits when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. The country of Israel as a whole contained roughly 3 to 4 million inhabitants at that time. Here's what I'm getting at. The scene that would have likely been common during Passover at the time when Jesus rode in in this triumphal entry 
would have looked a lot more like the Million Man March, which took place back in 1995. I've put a picture of it for you on the screen. Regardless of how many people were actually there when this true historical event actually took place, one thing is crystal clear. What these people were shouting was an indisputable declaration of this man that was riding on the back of this young donkey as the God-man, the long-awaited king of the universe, the Messiah, the Christ, the savior of mankind. Look again at what they were shouting. The end of verse 37 into verse 38. It says, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Just think of the miracles that the gospels record that Jesus did during his three years of public ministry. Think about what these people had seen. They were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is a direct quote of Psalm 118 verse 26. And it is a verbal acknowledgement by this massive crowd of who knows how many were there. That Jesus has sovereign dominion over all of humanity. They were bowing down to worship him. He has jurisdiction over all mankind. This amazing event that we're reading about, that you're seeing on your screens, this event that we call Palm Sunday, most people don't realize that this is a foreshadowing event of something far greater, if you can imagine that. Something far greater that the Apostle John saw a vision of that's recorded in the book of Revelation. Now, this is still future for us, but in God's grand view of all of history, this has already happened. Take a look at Revelation chapter 7, and you'll see the very clear similarities to what we saw in history in Palm Sunday to what is going to be happening in heaven one day when we get there. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's Jesus. Clothed in white robes. And look what's in their hands. With palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God. Who sits on the throne. And to the Lamb. And look who's there. And all the angels. Those are also created beings. We're standing around the throne and around the elders. Those are representatives of the whole church. And the four living creatures, those are unique creatures which represent animal kind. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Do you see the scene that John aims for all Christians to see here? All of angel kind, all of mankind, all of animal kind represented there, bowing down before the throne, worshiping, waving palm branches, and recognizing the sovereign jurisdiction of Jesus over all heaven and all the earth. So if you're sitting at home right now and asking, what does this second point, that Jesus has jurisdiction over all mankind, have to do with my life right now at this particular point in human history? I want to put it to you as plainly as I can. Whatever Jesus wills comes to pass. And nothing comes to pass unless Jesus wills it. I think you should probably write that down. So I put it on the screen for you. Look at it again. 
whatever Jesus wills comes to pass. And nothing comes to pass unless Jesus wills it. Listen to me, Christian. He is in sovereign control over everything that happens in your life. Everything. So I want to ask you, which crown right now are you going to allow to captivate your heart and your mind? The crown virus, which has no jurisdiction whatsoever over your life. Or the crown of heaven, which has final sovereign say over everything that happens to you. You have to choose which crown is going to captivate you in this moment. Which crown are you going to be in awe of? Do not fear anything that can kill the body, Jesus said, but be awestruck by him who controls where you spend eternity. And that's Jesus. Be in awe of him. That's the second point. In the few minutes that I have left, I want to show you one final component of the jurisdiction of Jesus. Point number three. Jesus has jurisdiction over all matter in the universe. Said a little bit differently. All matter is comprised of energy. And so that's where I want you to focus. Jesus has sovereign jurisdiction over everything that is made of energy in the universe. All matter. Take a look back at verses 39 through 40. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Time out for just a second. They said this because here these men of faith were terrified of the Roman soldiers and what those soldiers might do because of the great stirring that was beginning to happen among the crowd. Keep reading. He, Jesus, answered, I tell you, if these were silent, meaning these people, the very stones would cry out. A figure of speech, no doubt, but a true statement of his sovereign dominion over all the matter in the universe, including the very stones. In science, matter is a term for any type of material or Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So when I say that Jesus has jurisdiction over all matter, I'm referring to any physical substance in the universe that is different from you or different from animal kind. I'm referring to anything that doesn't have a mind and doesn't have a soul or a spirit. That's what I mean when I say matter. He has jurisdiction over every rock and everything in the universe. Look back at the second part of verse 17 of Colossians 1. So I told you we'd be flipping back and forth. Go back to Colossians 1. It says there, In Him, in Jesus, all things hold together. This means that Jesus is the sovereign controller over the harmony over everything in the universe and how it all functions together. Even the smallest molecules, the things that we can't even see without a microscope, the tiniest particles, and yes, viruses, are under his sovereign jurisdiction. In fact, the greatest example of obedience, church, I, I really beg you to pay close attention here. The greatest example of obedience that we have in the Bible, apart from Jesus himself, is nature. Look at the most well-known example that we have found in Matthew chapter 8. You know this passage. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. 
And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Some people love the idea of a sovereign creator who's in control of all the universe. But the simple fact is that most people hate it. Most people don't like the idea of being under the jurisdiction of anyone but themselves. And so, since the time of the Industrial Revolution and only picking up speed since then, all of mankind has been on an expedition to find new things and create new toys, new mechanisms to help us discover something, anything, that's beyond the boundaries of his jurisdiction. And so you recall, those of you who were around then, in 1969, we decided to send a few brave men into the most uncharted territory. And so the space race began. And JFK announced, we choose to go to the moon. And why? In order that we might discover something new. In order that we might discover something that would enable us to see beyond what this lens has enabled us to see. In order that we might discover something beyond the boundaries of his jurisdiction. That's why we've been on this expedition. About four years ago, I shared the testimonies of a few of those brave pioneers who went to the moon. And I think our eyes and our ears are ripe once again to see and hear those testimonies once more. Listen to the testimony of a few of those brave scientists who went where no man had gone before with the hopes that they would be able to discover something beyond the boundaries of the jurisdiction of God. Listen to their testimony. Beginning with James Irwin. I felt the power of God as I'd never felt it before. The earth reminded us of a Christmas tree ornament hanging in the blackness of space. As we got farther and farther away, it diminished in size. Finally, it shrank to the size of a marble, the most beautiful marble you can imagine. That beautiful, warm, living object looked so fragile, so delicate, that if you touched it with a finger, it would crumble and fall apart. Seeing this has to change a man, has to make a man appreciate the creation of God and the love of God. What was it? that James Irwin beheld when he went on that expedition. Look at another from John Glenn. To look out at this kind of creation, out here and not believe in God, is to me impossible. It just strengthens my faith. I wish there were words to describe what it's like. Edgar Mitchell. My view of our planet was a glimpse of divinity. Suddenly, from behind the rim of the moon, in long, slow-motion moments of immense majesty, there emerges a sparkling blue and white jewel, a light, delicate sky-blue sphere laced with slowly swirling veils of white, rising gradually like a small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. And finally, Listen to what Neil Armstrong had to say. It suddenly struck me that that tiny pea, pretty and blue, was the earth. I put up my thumb and shut one eye, and my thumb blotted out the planet earth. I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. It's a great thing for a man to walk on the moon, but it's a greater thing for God to walk on the earth. Referring, of course, to Jesus, the God-man. 
Christian, what did these men, these explorers, behold that so changed them on the inside? And how is it that we could possibly behold it without having to go to the moon? Is it possible? You better believe it. You better believe it. Paul says that we are able to behold. That means to see, to catch a glimpse of that same glory, but even more so in the face of Jesus. Look on your screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So you want to be changed? You want to be captivated? You want to be held in awe by something? It's the face of Jesus Christ that will captivate you forever. So you have a choice in these coming weeks, these coming months, as this storm that's settling on our earth begins to settle and a new normal begins to ensue. What are you going to allow to captivate your heart and your mind? Church, I've had a song running through my head for the entire week as I was preparing. The song goes, Behold our God seated on His throne. Come, let us adore Him. I implore you, Christian, to allow your heart and mind to be so fixated on the face of Jesus, on the words of Jesus, on the person of Jesus, on the coming of Jesus, on that image that John gave us of the Lamb seated on the throne. Because if you don't, something else is going to captivate you. And I promise you, I promise you, it will not leave you in a better place. And so, Father, I can't see my friends I can't see my church, but my heart goes out to every one of them. My heart longs to see them again. And I just pray right now in this moment that you would give us a glimpse of your glory. Show us the face of Jesus in our hearts through your word so that we can be captivated by him as you have designed us to be. He and he alone is worthy of of our constant gaze, because what else is more beautiful? What else is more awe-inspiring than the Son of God who would come to earth and lay down His life for us? So wherever you are, whether you're in your living room or your car, your kitchen, your den, whether you're alone, whether you're with your family, I pray that God would give you a glimpse of Jesus that would settle your heart and mind and give you such a peace that you would never turn away to look at anything else. Let us keep our eyes fixed on the author and perfecter of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to go from this service with the peace that passes understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.